Would you turn with me to Exodus chapter 20? Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 12. The title of today's message is, Don't Dish Your Mama. Y'all know what command this is referring to of the Ten Commandments? Honor your mother and father. Don't dish your mama. All right. If you would stand with me as we read our verse today, starting in verse 12. Exodus chapter 20. Remember, God spoke these words to the nation of Israel. Everyone heard it. Verse 12 says, Honor your father and mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your ways, for your word, for the clarity that you bring to us through your word. God, and I pray as we examine this subject of honoring our mother and father and how basic it is for Christian living, I pray you would convict us of sins, Lord. We have failed this command. Show us what we need to do um, in light of that. Help us to be sensitive to you, Lord. I pray you would use me as your tool and your vessel this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may recall that the Ten Commandments are kind of split into two sections, so to speak. The first couple of commands refer to our relationship with God, and then the last part of the commands have to do with the relationships with others. And so in doing that, Jesus was asked, what's the greatest command? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. Very good. But there's some other verses in Scripture, I want to highlight a couple today, that show what God really feels about honoring our parents. Listen to these. Exodus 21, 17 says, Anyone who curses their father and mother is to be put to death. That's pretty serious. Leviticus 20, verse 9, Anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. Because they have cursed their father or mother, their blood will be on their own head. Well, you flip to the New Testament, listen to what Jesus says, Matthew 15, verses 3 and 4. And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God has said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. That story needs some more clarity, because Jesus goes on to talk about there how the Pharisees were nullifying the command of God so that whatever is dedicated to the Lord, they do not have to honor your mother and father. And so they were mis misapplying God's word and their own traditions. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul says this, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first command with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on earth. Jesus, when he was on the cross, he spoke seven statements. And you know, one of those statements had to do with taking care of his mother. You recognize that? Last, some of the last phrases Jesus said while he was dying on the cross had to do with taking care of his mother. And what did he say? As he was dying there, the Apostle John, John the Beloved, Jesus' best friend, so to speak, while he was living on earth, John was standing there next to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and John tells, or Jesus tells John, John, behold your mother. And then Jesus tells Mary, behold your son. In other words, John was given the responsibility to take care of Mary. Jesus thought, and he took this command serious, to take care of his parents, even after he was gone. In Romans chapter 1, verse 30, and 2 Timothy 3, verse 2, Paul gives many characteristics of evil people in the world, and he lists among those characteristics those who disobey their parents. And in other parts of this list, he says, disobeying their parents along with God-haters, slanderers, murderers, ungrateful, lovers of money, boastful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, brutal, and treacherous. And he lists those who disobey their parents along that list. 
So in the view of the first century Jew, and also it should be in our view today, those who disregard or disobey their parents or do not honor their parents are like these other people, God-haters. You realize how God feels about this command? And it seems that honoring one's parents is the most basic good that someone can do. And to break this command, it seems that it will overflow into a lot of other horrid activities. Would you agree? My first question I'd like to address today is, who are our parents? Who are our parents? And in our age, our nuclear families are being severed, and the family dynamic is being shifted around, and who are actually our parents? And it seems like our, our parents may be beyond those who naturally gave birth to us. It may expand more than that. And so I would just define it simply as a parent are those who raised us as their own, which includes... Our parents could include a guardian, could include a grandparent. But those who raised us as their own. Why do we honor our parents? Why do we honor our parents? Why did God put this command in Scripture? I'll give you three things to help us think about as we examine this question, why do we honor our parents? Number one, our parents are our first relationship. You ever recognize that? Your parents, those who raised you, are your first relationship with a human. They're the first people to show you love, to feed you, to change you, to care for your basic needs as a baby. Our relationship with our parents, whether it be good or bad, it shapes our view of God. Do you recognize that? Your first relationship with a human, especially your parents, the authority figure in your life, shapes your view of God in an early age. God is associated as a father, right? And so your view of your father often impacts your view of God, which is a good challenge for fathers to live godly lives because that's how your child, your child is going to view God. If children grow up not learning to obey their parents, their first basic need and basic relationship, they will struggle, struggle to obey other authorities. If they do not obey the authority established by God in the early ages, then they're going to struggle obeying other authorities. And the most primary authority they're going to struggle to obey is God himself. So for parents to teach their children how to obey is actually teaches them a more fundamental thing of how to obey God who is above the parent. Are you tracking so far? About two or three of you. I'll take what I can get. Number two, our parents help form us. Our parents help form us. It seems fitting that God would command us to honor our parents because they are not only the first relationships that we have, but they are most pivotal in our development. Would you agree? Your parents are most pivotal for your development as a person, as a child. They care for us when we couldn't care for ourselves. In light of this, this is why children should take care of their parents as they age and cannot take care of themselves as well as they could. They form us in our early years. They teach us habits, sometimes good, sometimes bad. But they teach us habits. They should show us how to live, how to live godly lives. They're your, they, our parents are our first role models, whether we like it or not. Whether good or bad, they are our first role models. And number three, strong families are the basis of a strong nation. Strong families are the basis of a strong nation. What do you mean by that? For Israel, remember, the text was for Israel in the Ten Commandments originally. What did that mean for Israel? They were to settle in the land of Canaan, the promised land. When God gave them the initial Ten Commandments, they were not yet in the promised land. They were still en route to the promised land. They traveled to the edge of the promised land right after this. And then God told them to go in. 
they didn't go in. They sent spies. The spies came back and they were afraid to go in. And so God said, fine, you're going to wander in the wilderness until this whole generation dies and the next generation is going to go in. So for 40 years they wandered into the wilderness and then finally, at the end of that 40 years, Moses was barely still alive and then in the book of Deuteronomy, he restates the Ten Commandments in chapter 5 and he puts it the same way of honoring their parents to live in the land. If you honor your parents, you will live a long time in the land. It was a, definitely a correlation for obeying the parents and living in the land. But why was it so important? Because God promised them the land all the way back from Abraham. He told Abraham and his, that his descendants will have this land, the promised land. And for this land to be secured... They had to establish the families. Why? Because strong families are the basis of a strong nation. You agree? You want to disrupt a nation? You want to make a nation weak? Where do you attack? The family. I hope you can see the correlation of that with America today. It should be pretty obvious to us how the families are being attacked. It's the backbone of a nation. When the families are disregarded and marginalized, are nowadays are redefined beyond what the scripture demands, the nation will be weakened. I'm going to give you some statistics, and these were quite shocking to me, and I hope they're eye-opening to you. 23% of children in the U.S. are in single-parent homes today. 80% of those are single mothers. This, this statistic I'm about to share is, was really eye-opening. As of 2016, 40%, 40% of children born in the U.S. are born outside of wedlock. 40%. That's almost half of the children are born out of wedlock. It was, it was 28% back in 1990. You can see at this rate, in another 20 years, 25 years, it's going to be even worse. Only about 16 of those, of 16 percent of those mothers actually marry the father of that child within five years after being birthed. The increase of single parent homes has dramatically affected the development of a child, and especially. Children that grow up in a fatherless home. Fatherlessness is an epidemic in America. And it's sad. But I don't think that people really realize just how impactful a father is to the household. Listen to these statistics and some of this stuff. For those that grow up with a father in the home, they are more likely to be wealthy the children are more likely to grow up to be wealthy. They'll grow up to be more educated, successful employees, healthier, socially, mentally, and physically, less depressed, less addicted, happily married, problem solvers, self-sufficient, ethically aware, curious, chance takers, con confident, hardship overcomers, and spiritual. All because they have a father in the home. The opposite is true. For those that grow up without, without a father, absent father homes, or even abusive father homes, or absent-minded fathers. Just because a father is present doesn't mean he's active, right? Here's some other data. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. 63%. Fatherless homes. 85% of children who exhibit behavioral disorders. 85% are from fatherless homes. The data suggests that children from single, single parent families are twice as likely to suffer from mental health and behavioral problems than those living with married parents. Twice as likely. Some data also suggests that children without fathers are 10 times more likely to abuse chemical substances. And 71% of all children who abuse substances are from fatherless homes. 71% of 
High school dropouts are from fatherless homes. Kids from fatherless homes are 20 times more likely to be incarcerated. Are these statistics shocking to you? <laughs> Sadly, they're not. <laughs> it's like, well, we kind of expect that. We see that day to day. But just seeing these numbers just on paper, like, wow. These are very insightful and, and saddening. But we're seeing this every day. Watching the news every day. Hmm. I found this to be interesting in the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. When abortion was made illegal, do you know what else increased? Fatherless homes. When abortion was made illegal, abortion was made legal, I should say, sorry. When abortion was made legal, fatherless homes increased. And what we, did, what we just shared with you, all those stats will then continue to increase, will continue to get worse as abortion is made legal and fatherlessness, fatherless homes continue to increase. You see the resemblance? You see the connection there? It is sad. And what do we hear in America today about the men? They talk about men as if it's toxic, right? Toxic masculinity. I'm sure you've heard that. Whether it be on social media, on the news, or whatever, hopefully you hadn't been called that. Pray to God you haven't. But they're trying to eliminate manhood. But as we can see, the stats show we need men. Amen? Amen? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> we need men to stand up and be fathers. And here's some good news. Even if you don't have children, listen to this stat. Even those that grow up in a fatherless home, children that have a mentor are 55% more likely to go to college and better their lives just because they have a mentor. Not necessarily a father, but someone who's stepping into that role and helping that child. That's where we can step in and start taking people under our wing and challenging them and helping them grow. Even if we don't have a direct child, we can have a direct impact. Amen. The family must be cherished and secured because it is establishing a strong nation. As a Christian, it's our duty to uphold biblical values of the family. And even if your family is split, and divorced, remarried like mine, there's still hope to be found in Christ because what I've seen Christ do in my family's life I have a godly father and a godly stepfather, godly mother and a godly stepmother because of what Christ has done in them. The Christ can redeem it for sure. So don't, don't be beating yourself up or looking down just because things look bleak. Christ can do anything. Keep praying. Keep studying. And, and if you are a parent or a step-parent or... or have an ability to make an impact or pray for your child, pray for those that are under you, that, that you have an impact, that God may use you. But also recognize that you're not going to be perfect. There is no perfect parrot, right? Oof. I need to say that again because that was kind of quiet. There, there are no perfect parrots, right? <laughs> okay. Has anybody been a perfect parent? If you have been, I really need to talk to you later. <laughs> Take some, it might be, maybe you need to write a book. All right? There are no perfect parents, which means that when we mess up, as, uh, I say we, I'm not a parent, but when we say, when we mess up, we need to confess. Confess our sins. Sometimes even to our kids. Right? To those that are under us. Saying, look, look listen here. I messed up. I'm sorry. I need you to seek, ask, I need you to forgive me. I didn't act right on this occasion. I, I got too emotional over here or this or that. Recognize the kids need to see the parents responding to sin because that teaches them how to respond to sin. Right? And that's hard to do. To take a knee and say, you know, I'm, so, I'm really sorry about what I did and how I did this. It teaches them forgiveness and it teaches them how to ask forgiveness. 
That's a picture of Christ, right? And also we need to forgive ourselves whenever we mess up. Investing in the children's total well-being. They're physical, emotional, and most of all, spiritual. Ephesians 6 verse 4, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in training and instruction in the Lord. That's our, as fathers, that's your primary responsibility. Bring in your child up in the Lord. As the scripture says. Colossians 3, 18 through 21. Wives, submit to your husbands as fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives. Do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will be discouraged. We need fathers and mothers to be involved in their kids' lives, not just present, but involved. And we're seeing now in our culture that the parents aren't parenting. They may be baby mamas and baby daddies, but they're not mothers and fathers, right? And they're pawning off their parenting to other people. Grandparents, brothers and sisters, teachers in the classroom, pawning off to the church to teach them spiritual stuff, and they just have a hands-off, laissez-faire approach to parenting. That's not parenting. That's not how the Bible describes it, and that's what, not what parents need to do, right? Do you agree? You know where the child should learn most about God? At home. That's where the child should learn the most about God. Not just knowledge about God, but seeing how that impacts your everyday life. Because you're not every day at church learning from the pastor or teachers at church, right? But you can learn at home because you're at home every day. When need parents take up responsibility to raise their child. Now let me get off that soapbox and move on to another one. Yeah, that's all right, Miss Linda. And she said, please. <laughs> now, or the next question I want to ask is, how do we honor our parents? How do we honor our parents? I think number one, the most basic understanding of this passage for Israel is to take care of the parents in their increasing age. This is pretty basic. Parents are going to get older. We're all going to get older. And it's the cycle of life. The parent takes care of the child as the child is young and, and can't take care of themselves. So when the parent gets older and can't take care of themselves, the child helps them in response. It's, it's a natural order of things to take care of them in their increasing age. And this is especially true in a culture like what Israel was experiencing where they didn't have Social Security, they didn't have retirement funds, they didn't have nursing homes, they didn't have all of these other help. They had to do it themselves. And I think that is still true today, not, not, not saying that we can't take advantage of some of those things, but we shouldn't pawn off just because we can. We need to take care of our parents the best way that God has provided for us. Proverbs 23, 22, Listen to your father who gave you life, and do not despise your mother when she is old. 1 Timothy 5, 3 through 4, this was actually a passage that in the Timothy's church, they had a, a widow's ministry, a widow's program. And Paul was outlining here, well, who are the widows? And he says this, Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn, first of all, to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family. And so repaying their parents and grandparents, for this is pleasing to God. As you see what Paul is saying, but put your religion to work. You say you love God, you say you worship God, then honor your parents. Don't pawn off and put all the, put all the church in the responsibility to take care of your parents. You do that. That's what Paul was saying. If for those, for those uh, widows that actually have children and grandchildren under them. Now, I've heard many stories and I'll probably continue to hear stories of families with aging parents, and then, you know, one sibling ends up doing the majority of the work for the parent. Anybody ever seen that or been a part of that? Yes, yes. Hey, if you have an unbelieving brother or sister, just know that they're going to act like an unbeliever, right? You, as a believer in Christ, as a follower of Christ, need to do what you can 
to honor your parents and do the best you can. Now, it would be great if everybody just got along and everybody just took, took and did their own, did, took care of their own responsibilities and there is a, you know, a, a system for how to take care of the parents, but it doesn't always happen like that, right? It's hard to deal with people, especially family. You can't change your family. It's not like you can go in and, you know, put in an order on Amazon and get a new brother or something. But maybe that's coming. But as of right now, we can't do that. So we have to work with what we got. And just show Christ with our relationships with our siblings and with our relationship with our parents. You are only responsible for how you act. Not how your sister acts or your brother or your stepbrother or whoever else. You are responsible for you. And caring for our parents, please understand this, honoring our parents is not conditional for how the parents treated us. Do you agree with that? It's not conditional or contingent. Well, they were terrible to me when I was younger, so therefore, I get to be terrible to them when they get older. Is that what Jesus did? It's a good thing he didn't. Instead, what did he do? He said, love your enemies. Love those who persecute you for those who hate you, mistreat you. You love them. And he demonstrated that ultimately by dying for all of us who abused him. By dying on the cross for us. We show love to our parents regardless of how they loved us. Because it's a picture of how we, or what Christ did for us and how we reflect Christ thereof. Number two, how do we obey our parents by obeying their instruction. Obeying their instruction. Children, whether young or old, should obey their parents. It doesn't matter how old your parents are, you still should obey them. But we obey them out of respect of their authority. The authority that God has given them over us. It is, it is sanctioned, ordained by God, the family structure is. And so we should love and respect our parents because in doing so, we love and respect God who ordained it. Tracking? That means when we disobey our parents, then we also disobey God. Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 3. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. I'm not sure how many of you have seen this, but I have. For instance, a family with children in sports, the mom and dad bring... Uh, the family to the baseball field. Mom and dad's carrying all the stuff. Y'all seen it. Mom and dad's carrying all the stuff. Mom and dad get the kid whatever he wants. It's command. The kid bosses the parents around. The parents give empty threats to their kids. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Is this good parenting? What's the kid actually learning here? The kid's learning, well, the parents are giving empty threats. I can do what I want. Because they're not, not actually going to follow through with their threats. They think it's cool to boss their parents around. The kids are doing more the authority, or the, the authority in the house than the parents are. The kids are learning to be entitled because they can have other people carry and do their stuff for them. Thinking through some of these things, what in my actions, how am I teaching my children? What am I teaching? What are they learning by what I'm doing? Just keeping those kind of things in mind. That's a simple, simple example. But those things over time can have longer impacts. Of course, if they can't actually carry their baseball bag, yes, help them. <laughs> but if they're able to, let them carry it. Children or Christian parents have a responsibility to instruct their child in a loving way and towards holiness. However, if parenting, if your parent inhibits your ability to be holy, in other words, maybe their instructions are not godly, then we are under no obligation to obey them. What do you mean by that? If a parent prevents you from reading your Bible, prevents you from going to church, prohibits you from praying, prohibits you from growing in your relationship with God, or even to do something that you know is wrong, like stealing from a store or lying to a police officer, 
you are under no obligation to obey their instruction ultimately. Why? Because your authority is primarily God. Right? You obey God first and foremost. He is your first parent. Your, your natural parents are your second parent. Kenneth Barker said this, to honor, to honor our parents is to prize highly, to care for, show respect for, and obey. And there's no age restriction on this. We never stop obeying our parents. Even as we get older, we should still love and respect and obey our parents. But I wonder if you've ever noticed something as, as you grow old and your relationship with your parents change as you grow older, right? And when you're younger, you obey your parent out of fear and respect. You may love them to some degree, but your love is a little bit different. It's kind of based on fear and respect. If, well, if I don't obey them, I'm going to get spanked, right? I'm going to get whooped. I'm going to get punished to some degree. But as you get older, you fear less and less getting punished, but you still love and respect and obey them because you love them. Have you, have you noticed that in your transition with your parent? Your parent used to be more of your authority figure as you're younger, but then they transition more to a friend as you get older. You still respect them and love them as a parent, obey them, but your relationship changes. And I think the same is true with our relationship with God. Initially, depending on how old you were, when you received Christ, you may obey God out of obligation. You may obey Him out of fear. As you grow and mature in Him, then you learn to obey Him because you love and respect Him. Just like you would a parent. Number three, how we obey our parents, how do we honor our parents, is to live irreproachably. Do not confuse the word irreproachable. I just needed an I word to keep the alliteration going. But do not confuse irreproachable with unapproachable. Okay, two different words, two different definitions. Irreproachable means beyond reproach. In other words, it's don't, do not give anyone a reason to think anything badly of you. Do not give anyone any reason to think anything badly of you. In other words, live a holy life, a righteous life, a blameless life. Live irreproachably. Living a holy life honors your parents because it reflects good on them. Now this is regardless of if they have lived a holy life, regardless if they taught you how to live a holy life. We obey our parents by living a holy life. I mean, we, we honor our parents by living a holy life because it does reflect well on them. Let me ask you a question. When do you stop being your parents' child? Sometimes you may, you may think, well, when my parent dies. Well, you're still living. <laughs> You're still your parent's child even after they die. You stop being your parent's child when you die. Right? And so we continue to honor our parents even after they pass. And this is one of the ways we can do so by living a holy life. Living a holy life. Taking care of the things that they have given us. That leads us to number four. Taking care of the inheritance. For Israel, the inheritance was the land primarily, and to establish the nation secured in the, in the land of promise, to maintain the national integrity, and to mishandle the inheritance was to spit in the face and the promise of God. That's for Israel. If you obey your parents, you will live long in this land. You'll live a long life in this land. That's what the promise was for Israel. New Testament. The word for land there can be translated earth. And Paul uses the word earth there. He says, honor your mother and father. First command with a promise that it may go well with you and you have a long life on earth. Some of you may be thinking, well, I don't even want to live long here on earth. <laughs> as bad as it's getting, that seems like a punishment. But in their, in their eyes, in first century mind, living a long life on earth was a blessing from God. In other words, if you honor your parents, it means that you will be blessed by God. You will be blessed by God. Now, how do we take care of the inheritance today? 
I'm sure many of you have been a part of families and mothers and fathers that have passed and left an inheritance, left a will. Part of taking care of the inheritance, honoring our parents, is doing what they want to with the will. If it's not unbiblical, you know, if they tell you to do something wrong with it, then I would question that. But if it's, if it's uh, negligible, then you do what they want to with, their inherit with the inheritance that you have. But I also would like to say this. So many families I have seen broken up, and I've heard stories of families that are broken up because of greed over the inheritance. Have y'all seen this? I've heard of this. Families that are just divided because of greed. And you think, what, you think, what would your parents think? How would they react to you or your brothers and sisters over the inheritance debacle? They would be ashamed at some of the things that people do because of greed. Right? And it's a sad thing. We need to understand as Christians, our money, even the inheritance that we may get from our parents, is not ours. Whose is it? It's God's. God's blessing us with inheritance, but it's not ours. We're to be good stewards or good managers of that money. So we need to ask God, God, this is your money. What do you want me to do with it? Right? Don't let greed divide relationships. That's stupid. But that's what Satan's going to pry on because he knows how greedy we are sometimes. Being careful of that. But there is an even greater inheritance that we need to be concerned with. An even greater inheritance. What do you think that is? The inheritance that is permanent. An inheritance that is above. If you are a believing parent in here today, if you are a follower of Christ, the greatest inheritance you can extend to your child is the gospel of Christ. Amen? That's the greatest gift you can give to your child. But just know this, your child cannot accept it. Your child cannot automatically receive it just because you have it. Right? People and children do not automatically get a free pass into heaven because they have believing parents. It is a personal choice. And everyone has to make that personal choice. As a parent, though... What you can do is extend the gospel, share the gospel, teach the gospel to your kids, and start young. Start as young as you can to teach them the truth, because if you don't teach them the truth, they surely will be taught a lie in the school systems, in social media, through their friends, and through this world. And if we don't teach them the truth and how to discern truth from error, they will certainly fall for the error. Amen? The greatest gift you can give your child is the gospel. Can't make them take it but we can give them every opportunity. Because they need to hear it. Romans 10, 17. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through faith about the Word of Christ. How can they accept the message unless they hear the message? And they need to hear it. Not just see it lived out. They need to hear it. He says, I don't want to talk about the gospel. I just live the gospel. That's great. Live the gospel. But don't, don't be afraid to talk about it either. People need to hear the message. That's how they hear the truth. And the best thing that we can do as children to honor our parents, the best thing we can do is receive Christ. That's the best way you can honor your parents is receive Christ and live a holy life. Why do you say that? Even if you have unbelieving parents, you know the best thing you can do if you have an unbelieving parent, tell them about Jesus. That's the best way to honor them. Tell them the truth. Have that tough conversation with them. Why? Because you love them. And you want them to share the truth. And just like the parents can't make the child believe, you can't make your parents believe either. But you can share the gospel. You can share it. I'm going to give you a couple things, and this goes beyond our parent, parent relationships, but how do you even start a conversation about that? I know sometimes it can be awkward how to start a conversation about Christ, how to start a gospel conversation. I'm going to give you four things that you can think about, that you can, four questions you can ask to kind of start a, a gospel conversation. And I know that's a, that's a hard thing. Anybody have, agree that that's a hard thing to start? Don't even know, like, how do we even start a gospel conversation with someone? 
Anybody ever have that struggle? A couple of us? I do. Here are four questions you have that you can ask, and it comes in the form of CARP. C-A-R-P. Don't confuse the R and the, R and the A there. C-A-R-P. CARP is a type of fish, right, Jerry? So we're going fishing. All right, just going fishing here. C. C is church. Here's a good question. Do you go to church anywhere? You can ask, of course, you can start this with your parents. You can start this question with anyone, a stranger, a friend. Why don't you go to church? That might be a follow-up question. If you know that they don't go to church, why don't you go to church? Or would you be willing to go to church with me? It's kind of a low-level question, kind of get them in that right direction to, to initially or to eventually present the gospel to them. Church is C. What about A? A is the afterlife. Do you ever think about the afterlife? That's a good question to ask. Do you ever think about the afterlife? How about number three? Religious beliefs. I know I'm going a little bit long. Y'all hang on just a smidgen longer. I'm almost done. Number three, religious beliefs. What are your religious beliefs? What do you think about religion? And then number four is pray. This is the easy one. How can I pray for you? How can I pray for you? So easy starter conversations that you can lead. There may be follow-up questions that you can ask depending on how they answer. But this is some good starter questions to get you in a gospel conversation. How do you receive Christ? Admit, believe, and commit. Admitting you're a sinner and repent. Believing in Jesus and what he did for you on the cross. And believing who Jesus is. He is, he is the Son of God, but also God himself, who died for us for our sins and rose again to conquer death. And we also commit our life to Him. It's not enough just to know we're sinners and believing in Jesus. We must commit our life to Him. To follow Him, to do what He wants. Have you committed your life to Jesus today? I want to give you that opportunity to do so. And if you do that, this is the greatest inheritance you'll ever receive. Inheritance that is stored for you in heaven. What does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world, He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have... How long is that? Forever. Forever and ever. And that's the beauty of receiving Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the opportunity we have to come here today and to study it and to talk about this tough subject, especially how it has such a, a dire impact on our life and the life of, the, of this nation, of every nation. And how it impacts our relationship with you, Lord. Help us to honor our parents. And to take care of them, Lord. And to live an honorable life to honor them. But ultimately, God, we honor you by honoring them. Father, I pray for anyone here today that needs to receive you as their Lord. That they would admit that they're sinners. And come to you for salvation. To believe in the salvation. This, this, the saving of Jesus on the cross and to commit their life to following you. And I pray that we would be bold to share that simple gospel message to our families and our friends. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.